Um, yeah, so a couple changes there. I'm kind of halfway between Canada and Scotland right now. I'm starting at Glasgow in, in September. Um, so that's different. Also, um, I sort of narrowed my, my topic from the original abstract. So um, thanks for inviting me to this unique and wonderful conference. Uh, I've learned a lot, and I'm really excited about kind of all the innovative work I've heard uh, being done on Mindanao. Um, I come from a, a US history background, so uh, the, you know, I'm often you know, the only person at the conference talking uh, about Mindanao and you know, having to explain every single term, and uh, not having to do that here is, is, is uh, a wonderful relief. Um, but I'm, I'm really humbled to be uh, among scholars with, with so much re regional expertise. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, so my program abstract describes a larger article uh, or set of articles, I'm not sure, that I'm presently working on uh, involving um, uh, the creation and, and maintenance uh, of imperial labor regimes. This is something that um, I didn't end up being able to fit into my first book, which is uh, coming out next year. Uh, and given the limitations of time here, I want to focus on a couple key examples uh, of the inter interrelationship between work uh, and empire building in the southern Philippines. Uh, so in particular, I'm interested in, in road building and the creation of model communities uh, in the district of Lanao under U.S. military governance. Uh, in terms of, of situating this, uh, there's, a, there's a growing body of writing on the U.S. colonial state uh, in, in Mindanao and the Sulu Archipelago, uh, but North American scholars have traditionally tended to uh, what else, uh, military conflict, uh, although over the last couple decades this has begun to change. Some of you might have seen uh, Michael Hawkins' work or Crane Walther's work that, that uh, uh, deals with other topics like race and, and, and religion. Um, but no larger project has, has addressed the complex ways that uh, labor shaped U.S. colonialism uh, across Mindanao and the Sulu Archipelago. Uh, and the topic remains disconnected from this uh, really sort of exciting, innovative body of scholarship uh, on the constitution and centrality of work uh, to U.S. extraterritorial control. So there's, for instance, we go further north, uh, there's a lot of work being done uh, on Filipino la labor migration uh, sort of uh, within and, and, and outside of U.S. Uh, extraterritorial possession stuff on the Panama Canal, Cuba, uh, uh, other topics like this. Uh, so I'm thinking about sort of how, how do we situate uh, this topic kind of within that. So behind me here is a quote uh, from uh, the Chicago Daily Tribune in September 1899. It's not talking about Lanao, but it, it, it gets at some of these ideas that, that I kind of want to pick apart here. Uh, this is a few months after the Americans uh, arrive uh, in Sulu and, and uh, make what's called the Bates Agreement uh, with the Sultan of Sulu. Uh, and part of the article reads, the people of the island are even now thinking less of war and more of legitimate labor. Uh, and this connection uh, between military violence uh, and labor is, is something that we see again and again throughout the period of U.S. occupation. Um, even in these opening days of rule, the idea of work, of legitimate labor, drove colonial policy, and this, this uh, accelerates in coming years. So you probably, most of you have probably encountered the term, uh, the moral problem, uh, whether you know, in U.S. colonial history or uh, Philippine national history. Um, and this is often framed as an issue of labor uh, by, by colonial policymakers. Uh, the moral rehabilitation of the imperially constructed Moro uh, would be determined in this narrative uh, by their su successful adop uh, adoption of Western modes of production and consumption. Uh, so to state actors, this meant blending military violence uh, with applied labor programs tar targeting Muslim and Lumad communities. Uh, and so we see this in a very, very variety of areas during the period. Um, youth industrial education curriculums, which Corrine will tell you more about, uh, public works projects, state-run marketplaces, to, to name only a few. Uh, so I'm using Lanao here uh, because it remains understudied in the literature beyond uh, battlefield narratives in terms of the U.S. period, although uh, Midori Kawashima has done some really important work on this. Um, and in the following, I want to assess how road building and colony making became ca categories by which civilizational fitness could be produced, uh, assessed, and contested in the southern Philippines. Uh, so some quick background here, and, and forgive me if this is redundant. Um, Lanao posed unique challenges to the American colonial state. Uh, previous Spanish missionary and military efforts there had been limited, uh, and the re inland region lacked the accessibility of Cotabato, Zamboanga, or Holo, uh, making it difficult to map and control. Uh, 
Beyond this, Americans found uh, Maranao politics opaque and struggled to understand the shifting alliances and kinship networks that differentiated groups around the lake. Uh, collaboration with local Datus did not emerge as readily uh, as in Tausug or Maguindano territories, and those that did, um, famously with this guy here, John Pershing, uh, often extended only to small collections of villages, uh, just because of these complex sort of uh, uh, power structures in, in Lanao. With the Philippine-American War winding down in 1902, U.S. military forces focused on pacifying Lanao. Uh, Army bat battalions led by Colonel Frank Baldwin and Captain John Pershing clashed repeatedly with Maranao groups, uh, re resulting in hundreds of Moro deaths and rel relatively few American casualties, a pattern that would repeat itself throughout the American period. Uh, the military established bases at the northern and southern ends of the lake and Pershing personally conducted campaigns to bring the Maranao into the colonial fold. And these sort of combined uh, charm offensives with massive displays of military force uh, targeting uh, uncooperative Datus and Sultans. Uh, while the U.S. military was able to use the complex local politics of Lanao to their advantage in certain cases, uh, they also viewed fragmentation as a long-term impediment to governance. Uh, Pershing and other officers saw collaboration as sultans and Datus as a means of temporary pacification, uh, but also feared the reemergence of indigenous power centers that could mobilize greater opposition uh, towards the occupation. Uh, this was something that was in 1902-1903 you know, already occurring on Holo, uh, where uh, Groups of Taosuk uh, strongmen uh, had begun to push back against things like taxation, land surveys, uh, and the regulation of the maritime environment. So American Army officers in Lanao envisioned wage labor as a potential mitigating influence. Uh, creating a homogenous force of Maranao workers would decrease reliance on local leaders uh, and create modern colonial subjects capable of producing surplus value. Ideally, the sedentism of daily labor would also encourage the emergence of a consumer culture, uh, thus locking the Maranao into production consumption cycles necessary for colonial capital to flourish. Uh, gone would be slash and burn agricultural practices and local bartering systems, uh, replaced by a cash economy built on the backs of the Maranao peasant. Uh, so through this lens, labor became a means by which to simultaneously pacify and, and civilize. Lanao's uh, perceived disconnection from coastal Mindanao and the logistics problems this created for army forces on the march uh, made road building an early imperative. Uh, roads could forge links between the lake and coastal communities uh, like Iligan to the north or Malabang to the south, uh, integrating Lanao into the colonial state through rapid transfers of people and materials. In May of 1902, Army engineers and enlisted men began building a wagon road connecting Malabang to Camp Vickers, uh, 14 miles distant at the southern edge of the lake. Uh, Maranao men labored along the route, placing telegraph poles and transporting supplies, uh, and U.S. troops maintained a tentative relationship with these workers. Uh, the laborers provided crucial manpower uh, and topographical knowledge to American soldiers, uh, but also found themselves subject to various forms of imper imperial paranoia. paranoia. And indeed, if you go through the colonial archives, uh, the stories of you know, the diaries of American soldiers are, are filled with this you know, simultaneous uh, recognition of the need to use local labor and also fear of local labor as well. Uh, to the north, road construction occurred along a 20-mile stretch of territory linking Iligan to the lakeside settlement of Marawi. Uh, American engineers and surveyors grappled with a climb of nearly 2,000 feet, uh, while officers negotiated with Maranao Datus to acquire day laborers. Uh, in charge was the man who wrote this article, a guy named Major Robert Lee Bullard, uh, who was a uh, veteran of the North American frontier, uh, as many uh, U.S. officers and enlisted men were in the Philippines um, and turned himself into a colonial specialist in a different capacity, although that's another topic altogether. Um, Bullard lamented Spain's failed imperial mission and dreamed of drawing the Maranao into what he called the current of the world's progress. Uh, so roads became something other than just roads. Uh, they functioned as guideposts towards civilization or civilization as Im imagined by the United States. In Bullard's racialized worldview, the Iligan Marawi Road led Maranao communities away from a pre colonial past uh, or a Spanish colonial past, uh, typified by Islam, uh, polygamy, slavery, traditional kinship networks, and towards a future made legible by state power and directed labor. Uh, the major in this article here wrote these long, strange descriptions of how Maranao saw the Americans as gods who could force their subjects into slavery, yet beneficently offered uh, a living wage for, for their labor. Um, this, is a, uh, this article is, is totally a bizarre text, and uh, I would spend the entire 20 minutes talking about it, but I can't. Um, <laughs> 
As happens, reality was more complex than the colonial redemption narrative suggested. Cholera broke out amongst Americans and Maranao alike, uh, with the Maranao ad identifying the conditions brought by the Americans, warfare and dislocation, uh, as aggravating the epidemic. Uh, Bullard spent his days locked in tense negotiations with community leaders, many of whom reject rejected the culturally disruptive nature of American plans. Uh, and Moro labor gangs often worked uh, at odd hours and, 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 and not to the satisfaction of the Americans, who you know, many of whom emerged from, from this uh, rapidly industrializing uh, East Coast U.S. context and had a particular idea of what labor should look like. Even under less than perfect circumstances, however, uh, road work mitigated what Bullard saw as the danger of idleness uh, and instilled white military authority. Uh, writing for the Atlantic Monthly in March 1906, he boasted that the ills of lawlessness that plagued the region retreated as different factions collaborated to, quote, earn money together on the American road. Uh, the once favored, favored punitive expedition, pioneered by Pershing in the Lanao region, uh, had been replaced by what Bullard called the method of work. Um, the Illigan Marawi Road was, was plagued by practical challenges and, and underwritten by, um, thank you, uh, by Bullard's problematic ideas, but its completion did facilitate important connections between coasts and highlands. Uh, goods flowed more freely to Marawi, and its role uh, as commercial hub in northern Lanao sort of deepened in this period. Um, where am I? The markets in Marawi traditionally served communities along the eastern and western sides of the lake, uh, although individuals from these rancherias often had little contact with the colonial state. Uh, a circum Lanao road uh, envisioned by Pershing did not materialize, and most villages connected with each other via rudimentary paths and suited for heavy traffic. Uh, encounters with Americans in these isolated spaces frequently came in the form of search and destroy missions, uh, where troops burned Maranao crops as they scoured the landscape for, for outlaw bands. Uh, many areas remained uncertain surveyed and officials lamented the dif difficulties of inducing civilization uh, beyond the hubs of Marawi in the north and Camp Vickers in the south. Uh, appointed District Governor of Lanao in October 1906, uh, Captain John Macaulay Palmer uh, sought to build on Bullard's ideas. So this is kind of the second sort of example that I want to talk about. Uh, to do so, he developed plans that linked early infrastructural labor on the roads uh, to later ideas of reform through agricultural colonies. And any of you who've uh, had cause to, to study uh, the, the later years of the American operation, uh, occupation probably know about the rice colonies and, and all of these other sort of settler plans that, that came into effect. Uh, Palmer's goal was, broader goal was one of rationalization and control, of course. Uh, he wanted to reform the tribal wards, which is a government system established to channel customary leadership uh, towards official ends. Uh, and this involved mapping the boundaries of rancherias, of creating directories of local datus, uh, compiling all sorts of other statistics, so populations, uh, industries, resources, um, holding instructive conferences, uh, and developing new modes of taxation, basically uh, modernizing uh, the region itself. Uh, but it also relied on what Palmer called cooperative work. Uh, in early 1907, the district governor developed designs for a planned community across the Agus River from Marawi to be known as Dan Salon. Uh, he contacted American businessmen in Iligan, pushing them to harness what he called Maranao industrial capacity uh, and transform the nascent settlement into an economic powerhouse. Uh, there were precedents to this, of course, um, further west in, in Zambawanga, the district governor, uh, Captain John Park Finley, was experimenting with something he called uh, the Moro Exchange System, which was a, a series of state-run marketplaces that used capitalist methods to induce social change. Uh, Michael Hawkins has, has written a little bit about that, and there's something on it in my book as well. Uh, so inspired by this, the government in Lanao looked to the 32 native markets ringing the shores of the lake, or the 32 that they had identified, um, believing that Don Salon would serve as a hub for imported goods, uh, where white wholesalers would sell to traveling Maranao salesmen, and the salesmen would move these items through the native market system, encouraging the growth of a consumer culture. Uh, the need for surplus capital to buy these types of goods would lead to the development of new cash crops like hemp and coffee, uh, expanding the district's export outputs. Uh, the Datu would come to rely on American supplies in, 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 in Dan Salon, and the peasant, now habituated to the trappings of modern material culture, uh, would eagerly work for his consumables. So behind me, this is a, a blurry photo that I took um, in a military archive maybe five or six years ago with a really bad digital camera, so my apologies. Uh, it took me a while to translate what, what was going on there. Um, 
Palmer did not stay long enough to watch his plans come to fruition, uh, resigning in October 1907. Uh, but after returning to the United States, the former official maintained his interest in Lanao, uh, writing the provincial governor, a guy named Tasker Bliss, uh, with ambitious plans for reforming the region further. Uh, and Palmer's new plan, uh, this chart, of, which is a part of it, uh, involved the creation of a model colony uh, where 50 Maranao families would farm 40-acre plots. Uh, the community would grow coffee, cocoa, tobacco for export, uh, as well as staple crops for sustenance. Buildings, roads, bridges, and boat launches would all be maintained by mandatory labor. Um, and this particular element, the mandatory labor aspect of it, uh, was modeled on the Dutch system uh, in Java. So Palmer said, to quote him here, while the, while, the, while the idea of enforced labor is rather startling to Americans, its necessity in dealing with people like the Moros must be apparent to anyone who has had occasion to study them or similar peoples in Malaysia. So there's this sort of trans-imperial dimension going on here as well. Uh, mandatory labor was viewed as useful for transitioning the peasant class out of uh, what they called the slave system and into one where they voluntarily worked for profit. Uh, eventually, the colonies would self-perpetuate and lead to the development of other industries. So pa Palmer provided these charts showing profit projections, for instance, in order to incent the provincial governor to uh, help him build this colony. Um, the thinking was then, as it was later, that the success of the settlers laboring in this particular way, uh, or the settlers in the colony laboring in this particular way, uh, would be an object lesson to other Moros. So there'd be, a, there'd be like a domino effect, right? This is a similar <laughs> idea you see in, with the rice colonies as well. Um, the model colonies grew from a desire to stamp out local forms of organization. Uh, and during his time in Lanao, uh, Palmer complained bitterly about autonomously minded Maranao leaders. Uh, local Datus or some local Datus identified the changing job market as a potential threat uh, and growing labor mobility meant that uh, unmarried peasant men could change their residency frequently uh, and this undermined Datu authority which relied at least partially on the rhythms of traditionally structured communities. Uh, so labor became yet another way in which the colonial state challenged indigenous societies in the south. Uh, objections to American impositions, and there were many, uh, led to uh, increased activity by anti-state Datus, uh, the rise of outlaw bands and, and religious movements. Uh, some groups would fortify themselves in katas, uh, such as the one led by the Prophet UT near the mouth of the Taraka River. Uh, others used the hilly terrain to stage hit-and-run attacks on American troops and collaborating Maranao villages. Um, so labor sort of became a source of, of social disruption and, in the minds of Americans, a potential cure-all as well. So it had this kind of bifurcated uh, role. Palmer's colony ideas arrived at a time when military officials and white settlers across Mindanao and the Sulu Archipelago were experimenting with labor schemes. Uh, Finley's markets in Zamboanga were one manifestation of this, uh, but further east in Davao, uh, Euro-American plantation or owners tried to lure Lumad villagers down from the hills to tend abaca and coconuts. Uh, Patricia Dakudo's uh, recent uh, phenomenal dissertation on that talks all about this, and Dr. Abanalis has also uh, done, done work on this as well. Um, the specific colony model laid out by Palmer was not adopted, uh, but estimations of the Maranao continued uh, to be defined by their capacity for work. Uh, in 1911, for instance, the Washington Times lamented the U.S. Army's failure to create a, a class of effective laborers, say, blaming this for ongoing issues in the region. Uh, the rice colonies that would operate in Cotabato and Lanao under the Department of Mindanao and Sulu post-1913 uh, grew out of population pressures in the Christian North, but they were also tutelary fantasies that would have been familiar to Palmer. Uh, namely, the idea that if Moro families brought, uh, bought into the colonial labor model, others would see them prosper and follow suit. So redemption through labor ends up being this very durable concept in colonial in Mindanao. Um, and so what I'm trying to sort of think about with, with the larger article, I mean this one I just I just wrote about these two sort of case studies in Lanao. I'm trying to think more about sort of how work became this, this really, really durable concept uh, in, in uh, constituting U.S. imperial role in the southern Philippines. So I'm not... Um, I'm not as far along with it as I want, I want to be, but it's nice to talk about something that I'm actually doing in the future rather than um, my book, which is already done. So I'd be happy for any suggestions. Thanks.